Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Listen with Vobes. I'm Richard Vobes, and this is the channel in which we read old books, and hopefully good books. Things like Norman Collins's London, London Belongs to Me, which is what we are reading today. Uh, we are nearly halfway through this remarkable book that was published in 1945 and um, is set around 1938-39, just at the beginning of the... just before, rather, the beginning of the war, the Second World War, of course. Um, and uh, I would like to say a few hellos to a few people who have joined us so far. We have the lovely Julia, Turbo Stream, Dave Ivad, uh, Philip and Mary Hammond, Justine Jones, Sensible Paul, Billabong O'Neill, Jen Coley and Michael White so far who've said hello. But there may be others who are lurking at the back and just enjoying the story without participating, which is absolutely fine. Uh, Andrew Morris, Andrew Mo Norris, not Morris. I don't think we have an Andrew Morris. There may be an Andrew Morris somewhere in, in an alternative universe somewhere who's moved the N into an M, just to be different. Um, but it's Andrew Norris, who we love and adore, um, sitting out there in Croatia. I hope you've got nice weather out there. I thought I saw a flurry or two of snow, but um, it didn't really last. It's been a strange weather day today. I've been out walking and I've made a video which is ready to go for tomorrow. Um, and one minute it was warm, and the next minute it was freezing, and there was a cold breeze. But there we are. Linda Kane has arrived. Good afternoon each, she says, uh, which is nice. Um, we are in the process of reading chapter, I forget what chapter it is now, 37. Um, and uh, if I remember last time, if I remember last time, poor old Percy is still in clink. He has been formally charged. Mr. Josser is out collecting rent and he has just read the newspaper. I think that was the last we heard from him. And um, that's right, that was the last we heard from him. And then uh, we are on now to the next character, which is Connie. We're going to start with Connie. Uh, Andrew Norris says, we have a lot of snow. Blimey. How about that? The flurries I saw must have come from somewhere else then. Uh, let's just turn some of those knobs down so we don't get any interference from anything. I have a cup of coffee this afternoon. So, shall we proceed? It is now four o'clock. I always try and start a couple of minutes early just to let everybody uh, come in. Um, Julia, I have made a start on a jacket. Oh, well, uh, that sounds good. Uh, got to catch up, says Linda. Catch up, catch up, run faster, run faster. So here we are. This is um, the next bit. Oh, Mr. Norris is going to send, do send a picture, send a picture to my email and I can share it with everybody else. Let me just... Uh, switch my email on which I've moved my keyboard out the way for when I'm reading oh blimey I've just looked at my email I haven't looked at my email all morning because I've been out and been doing things and uh, it's very busy very busy oh I've just discovered Looking at this, the Doom Goblin is 18 now. Blimey. That's a bit of a nightmare. Um, anyway, yeah, send it over and I'll have a look um, and see if we, can, um, uh, if we can share it. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, let us crack on. Oh, I've just taken my glasses in a funny place. There we go. Even so. All oh, right. Well, hang on a minute. Even so. Um, so just to just to go back, he was reading the paper, wasn't it? And he, and he heard about the arrest and he says, can't be Percy, he said. They must have spelt his name right. They haven't spelt his name right. All the same, I'd better be getting back, he told himself. Can't leave mother alone at a time like this. So far as he was concerned, they could all go living rent free in Geneva Street. That's because he was trying to cat get the rent from the people in Geneva Street. Even so, he was beaten to it by Connie. 
She had been round to Madame Marie's dress agency to change her best frock, her summery mummery, for something a bit more generally useful. And for the transparent chiffon, plus seven and sixpence, she picked up a rather nice piece of moire with a nearly new sailor collar. It was an attractive little dress, even though it had gone a bit under the arms. As usual, the chief trouble in choosing it had been the size. At five foot one, she didn't even come into small ladies. In the eyes of the trade, she was still a juvenile. The new frock had got a label that said Business Miss sewn in the back. We have a picture from, um, uh, two pictures in fact, from uh, Andrew Norris, just to give us uh, a chill factor in today's show. Here it is. Look at that. Um, I guess that's along that big river that you have going through, um, e- e- what's it called, that place that you live in, Egrab or whatever? Um, <laughs> never, never get the pronunciation. I am so rubbish. And there is Zorro. Look at that snow. Gosh, in April. It's um, shocking. Absolutely shocking. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's very kind of you. Uh, t- uh, eight million billion emails. Yes, yeah, so 80 million billion. I know I get so many of them. And Anne H says, uh, hello all. Hello, Anne. Right, where were we? Anyway, um, yes. But she was excited about more than the dress. This is Connie. Clutching the paper carrier from swears and wells that Madame Marie had given her, just as though the dress had been a new one. Uh, oh, the paper carrier, as in the bag. Yes, yeah, sorry, I had a moment there thinking what the hell she... I thought she was carrying a newspaper. She was excited more than a dress, clutching the paper carrier from Swears and Wells that Madame Marie had given her, just as though the dress had been a new one. She was hurrying back to Dulcimer Street as fast as she could go. She was almost running, in fact. And the reason for this is the reason for this was that she had an evening paper in her hand, and she had seen about Percy too. She had her first success sooner than she expected. Just as she was coming in, she met Mr Puddy going out. He'd been resting all afternoon with his handkerchief spread over his face to help him concentrate, and he hadn't seen anything about anyone. Connie was therefore able to knock him all of a heap right on the doorstep. He read the paragraph all the way through twice. It was the evening news that Connie had bought, and there was more about it in there before speaking, and then he shook his head and drew his breath in noisily between his teeth. <sniffs> Good job. He's, he's, what? He's got somebody probably in the soup, he has, he said thickly. He'll have to wodge his steb. That is how he spells it as well, by the way. Wodge his steb. He's, he must be slightly bugged up, I reckon, that character. Isn't it terrible? Connie asked him. Can you think of anything worse? Mr Puddy paused. Does his budder know? He inquired. Don't ask me, she said, still a bit breathlessly. I'm just going to find out. I only knew myself five minutes ago. Mr Puddy would like to have been able to turn back and go with her, but he couldn't. He was late, and he had made yet... And he hadn't made... And he, sorry, and he hadn't yet made any preparation for the night watches. On his way to the factory, he had got to do a bit of shopping. He wanted a tin of baked beans, some cheese and half a pound of rich fruit cake. If he left things any later, he might not be able to get them. God to be boovig odd, he said apologetically. I'll buy a vapour myself. Talking to that. Achoo! Excuse me, I beg your pardon, ladies and gentlemen. I could feel the sneeze coming on. And his... Ah, sneeze! There's another one. Must be the summer cold coming through. Oh, no, it's Covid. Shush, don't say that word in here. But Connie wasn't bothering any more about Mr Puddy. As soon as he'd left her, she went bolting up the stairs to see Mr Josser. Uh, Mrs Josser. She 
It's, she hurried so much, in fact, that when she got there, she couldn't even speak, and in her agitation, she had quite forgotten to knock. All that she could do was to push the evening paper under Mrs Josser's nose and point. For a moment, Mrs Josser had great difficulty adjusting herself to Connie. She'd been sitting quietly, thinking about Mrs Vizard and Mr Squales, and was quite unprepared for sensation. The paper had been folded carefully into three, and it was a flat, sword-like object that came thrusting at her. Connie's finger hovered somewhere over the middle of it. And then she saw it. Runaway killer, she read. Percy Alano Alan Aloysius Boone, aged, seven, aged 18, garage hand of Dulcimer Street, SE11, already in custody on another charge, was today at Brixton Prison charged with the murder of Rose Sinclair, cashier in the fun fair. The murder took place on Wimbledon Common on the night of... But Mrs Josser read no further. She handed the paper back indignantly, although she didn't want to be caught holding it. I don't believe it, she said. Don't believe it? Connie repeated incredulously. It's him all right. There aren't two Percy Boons in Dulcimer Street. Mrs Josser seized hold of the paper and reread it. Whatever makes you think Percy would go... Whatever makes you think Percy would want to go and do a thing like that, she demanded. Connie shrugged her shoulders. That's just the seamy side of it, she explained. You can't be... you can't ever be sure with men. There was a pause. Then Mrs Josser looked up sharply. Does Mrs Boone know? she asked. Connie moved towards the door. I'm on my way up there now, she told her. I only dropped in here first. Well, we'll go up together, Mrs Josser said firmly. Percy Boone arrested for murder. Young Percy charged with killing someone. She kept repeating it over and over to herself incredulously as she climbed the stairs. It was going to be bad enough for Mrs Boone to have broken the news to her, even without Connie doing the breaking. But Mrs Josser needn't have worried. Mrs Boone's room was empty. On the table in the dining room was a dirty plate with a knife and fork still crossed on it and a half-eaten piece of bread resting against the side. In the bedroom, the wardrobe door had been left open. It was as though at that very moment on finishing a simple meal, something urgent had called Mrs Boone away. Connie and Mrs Josser looked across at each other. Then Connie put her thumbs down. Mr Josser had got back, had got back nearly half an hour ago, in fact, but he still gave the appearance of having just arrived. His hat and attaché case were on the table beside him and his umbrella, his new one, was crooked uh, and over the back of the chair. Oh, was crooked, rather. It was crooked. Crooked and crooked. They t are they spelt the same? Crooked and crooked. Just trying to spell. How would you, how would you spell crooked? And yet he's crooked. Hmm. Anyway, it's crooked over the back of the chair. I know what he means. Uh, they made a small mournful group, the three of them. And at the moment, nobody, not even Connie, was saying anything. Mrs. Josser was the first to pull herself together. Mrs. Vizard ought to be told. She announced suddenly. It's only fair. Mr Josser glanced up from the spill he was rolling. It was a spill made with the same paper that had contained the news. Why? he asked. Mrs Josser's lips were drawn in and determined. Because she'll have to hear sooner or later, and I'd rather she heard it from me, she replied. There was a pause. Connie raised her eyebrows but didn't say anything. It was Mr Josser who spoke. He put down the spill and got up. "'You don't want to face this alone, Mother,' he said. "'I'll come down too.' But Mrs Josser wouldn't hear of it. "'You go and sit down,' she said. "'You look tired enough already. "'Sit down and talk to Connie.' With that, Mrs Josser left them 
They heard the footsteps descending the stairs, and there was silence again. At the thought of the bombshell, her bombshell, well, properly speaking, Percy's bombshell, that Mrs Josser was about to deliver single-handed, Connie sat there writhing. For two pins she would have gone down with Mrs Josser herself. But she could see that she wasn't wanted and she didn't want to cause any unpleasantness now. Something told her that this wasn't going to be the end of the evening. All the same, it called for self-control, having to sit there doing nothing while things were happening. Somehow, Mr Josser didn't seem to count. He was absorbed in thoughts of his own, fiddling absent-mindedly with the spill again, folding it in half, rolling it sideways, doubling up the ends. It quite startled her when he spoke. "'I wonder if there's anything he'd like,' he said. He had not said who he was, but it was obvious. Connie gave a little titter. It was one of her inevitable moments of bad taste. "'He'd like to get out, that's what he would like,' she answered. But Mr Josser only shook his head. "'I meant something to read, or cig some cigarettes or something, "'something to take his mind off things.' And Connie thought. "'No harm in cigarettes,' she said. "'He can smoke all he wants now. "'It's later he'll miss it.' Mr Josser looked across at her. "'Then you really think he did it?' he asked. It doesn't matter what I think, it's what they think, Connie answered. They've got to prove it, that's all. There was silence again after that until Connie started humming in a distant, preoccupied sort of way. Do you reckon she knows or she doesn't? Connie asked with a jerk of her head in the direction of the ceiling. I don't like to think. I don't like to think, Mr Josser answered simply. Connie paused. Just imagine if she doesn't, she said. What a sad, sad homecoming. It was the sound of voices on the stairs that interrupted them, Mrs Josser's voice and Mrs Vizard. As they reached the door, they stopped suddenly. Connie swung round in her chair, expecting that expecting they were getting somewhere now. It wasn't Mrs Josser's bombshell any longer. Then... The door opened, and Mrs Josser, very red in the face, and Mr. Mrs Vizard, very white, stood there. Under the shock of the events, Mrs Vizard's transformation had half slipped from her. The black dress with the artificial flowers was still as smart as ever, but tonight it looked simply out of place. Under the new hairdressing, the expression was hard and angry. Mrs Vizard's heard, Mrs Josser said shortly. There was a little gasp from Connie as she said it. She never really liked Mrs Vizard, had disliked her on and off for years, in fact, but this was too much, knowing something like that and keeping it to herself. Did Mrs Boone tell you herself? she asked. Mrs Boone, Mrs Vizard answered. I've not spoken to the woman. Mrs Josser turned towards her husband. Did you hear that, Fred? she asked. Mr Josser felt uncomfortable. For no reason that he could think of, all three women were looking towards him at once. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, he muttered. Mrs Vizard's going to give Mrs Boone's notice when she gets back, she said. She thinks it'll get the house a bad name if she stops. Connie gave a little whistle. She'd never imagined any circumstances in which Mrs Boone could be disreputable and herself respect uh, sorry yes she never she never imagined any circumstances in which Mrs Boone could be disreputable and herself respectable uh, but if she wasn't surprised at what Mrs Boss Josser had just said she was more surprised at what Mr Josser answered he put his pipe down and even though he was only quite a small man, he got up looking the way Connie liked to see men look, almost big and commanding. If she goes, we go too, he said. As Mrs Josser didn't speak, it was clearly Connie's cue to say something. It was a big moment, a positive build-up. Me too, she declared, on the dot.'
Mrs Vizard's face wrinkled up, almost as if she was going to cry. It's all so horrible. I, I can't believe it, she said weakly. We thought... Who's we? M Mr Squales and I. We've been discussing it ever since we heard. Mrs Vizard did not raise her eyes from the floor as she was speaking. And who's... And who's Mr Squales to say what has happened to Mrs Boone? Uh, sorry, and who's Mr Squales to say what's to happen to Mr Boone, Mr Josser asked her. He was only thinking of the rest of us, thinking about number ten as a whole, she answered faintly. That's right, Kitty. That's all it was, said a deep, soft voice from the doorway. For myself, I'm sorry for her, deeply sorry. It was Mr Squales himself who was standing there. He must have come up the stairs on those pussy panther feet of his and been listening to them. His presence seemed to infuriate Mr Josser. So, this is your little idea, was it? he asked. Mr Squales' smile left him for a second. No, he said doubtfully. Oh, not entirely, that is, but uh, the publicity and all that. It, it just seemed better that we were... Uh, it just seemed better what we were suggesting. Much better, Mrs Vizard echoed him. If you turn her out, said Mr Josser, she comes and stays with us until we've got somewhere else to go. Then we go too, like I said we would. Shush! Mrs Josser stopped him. She raised her hand warningly. In the sudden silence, they heard the front door shut below them. They held their breath. There was only one person whom it could be. And as they listened, there was the faint noise of footsteps on the stairs. Mr Squales took Mrs Vizard's arm. Kitty, he whispered, we better be going down. But Mrs Vizard only shook off his hand. Quiet, she said. Then, in a flash, it was all over. There were the Josser's living room, with the door open and everyone standing there. The light streamed across the landing, lighting up the stairs, and the figure of Mrs Boone walked straight past them like a shadow. They had only one glimpse of her, bowed, secretive and silent, and then... She had gone on upstairs to her empty flat. She was shading her face in her hand. Mrs Josser took out her handkerchief. She knows, was all she said. Gosh. It was midnight. The last of the twelve strokes of Mr Josser's Westminster chimes had just floated up through the floorboards, round, pulsating and tremulous, like soap bubbles filled with sound. There were no lights burning any longer in number ten. But that didn't mean that everyone was asleep. The evening had been too disturbing for that. In their separate and individual ways, there, there were five of them awake in the house at this moment. Mrs Vizard, for instance, she was lying face down on the pillow as though she had been crying. Oh God, the shame of it, she was saying. The awful, awful shame. And just when there seemed to be so much happiness. I've never been like this before. It's only because I love him so. I didn't want anything like this to happen in my house while he was there. Why couldn't it all have been beautiful and pure that way? I hate Percy. Hate him. Hate him. Hate him. And Mr Squales, good and gentle. And at the thought of that gentle, good man and of what his presence in the house meant to her, she shuddered. Before going on to the bed... She had locked her door on the inside, not to protect herself from him, but to protect him from his own desires. She knew that she knew that if at this moment he'd been able to come to her, she would not have had it in her to resist. <laughs> 
And Mr Squales himself, the cause of this profound disquiet, he was lying on his back with his hands behind his head and his dark fingers laced together. He was not in the least enthusiastic about things. He'd stopped thinking about Percy and was thinking about himself. So, this is what it's to be, he pondered. This is what I've come to. He remembered the other women he'd known, other prospects and the promises of earlier years. It was like sitting in the sunset of a day that had dawned too brightly. It's really remarkable, he told himself philosophically, that with all my talents I shouldn't have been able to support myself. Men with half my brains manage to make a good thing of it. It's simply that with me... There is something somewhere that doesn't always click. The sunset feeling came over him more strongly than ever and blackened slowly into night. He lay there in the darkness counting his tragedies. Then, in his own private midnight, the moon, full and triumphant, rose over the pattern of his thoughts. All the same, he told himself, it could be worse... Might be a lot worse. I mean, it was worse last week. I couldn't see my way then. Now, at least I'm provided for. I don't have to worry about tomorrow's dinner. And the Jossers? They were a good deal nearer sleep than either Mrs Vizard or Mr Squales. They were lying as they had lain every night for more than thirty years, back to back, with just the middle of their spines touching. It was an attitude that was at once comfortable, intimate, and in winter, with a little more pressure, distinctly warming. Mrs Josser herself was very nearly asleep. The gates were fast closing, and her thoughts no longer belonged entirely to her. I ought to get away before he's too much mixed up in it. I hope he finds that cottage, she was telling herself. Poor, poor Clarice. I'm sorry for her. She never deserved it. She'd have to stay with us when it's all over. Only a chink of light filtered through the gates by now. In the dim obscurity of the interior, the figure of Percy had been lost somewhere in the shadows and the whole grim business had become exclusively Mrs Boone's affair. It wasn't Percy's murder any longer. Poor Clarence, she repeated once or twice, and then fell asleep. Mr Josser was still half awake. A little earlier he had been given up hope of ever getting to sleep at all. During the hour in which he had lain there, he had gone over the whole of young Percy's cased history, and he saw it all quite clearly. His lateness, his extravagance, his unreliability, his vanity. I suppose in a way it's my fault, he told himself. I ought to have done more for the boy. What young Percy needed was a father. If you could have seen Number 10 Dulcimer Street in cross-section, open clean through the middle like a doll's house, you would have realised how narrowly separated in space the various family existences fulfilled themselves. Mrs Boone, for instance, was within 15 feet of the Jossers at that very moment, but utterly cut off. When she closed her own door, the separation was complete. At that moment, she was probably the loneliest woman in London. Lonely, but surrounded and it was because she was surrounded that she had stuffed a handkerchief into her mouth so that the other people shouldn't hear her crying. Now, and at the hour of our death, were the words she had got to. There was someone else from Dulcimer Street who was nearly asleep, and that was Connie. Sh only she shouldn't have been nearly asleep. She was on duty. She was on duty. 
But it's very easy when the cloakroom is empty and no one wants to be pinned up behind because a shoulder strap has gone and there isn't even anybody in the lavatory just to, you know, nod off for a few seconds. Connie was nodding off now and her thoughts were not noticeably different from those that she'd been having while she was still properly awake. Business miss indeed, she was saying to herself. Business mischief. I'd like to know what she's been up to. It isn't just gone under the arms, it's rotten. Not that they'd hang not that they'd hang anyone of his age. Not actually hang him. Twenty years more likely. He'll come out looking like Rip Van Winkle. I ought to have taken it over before the I ought to have taken it over to the light before I bought it. You can pull the stuff apart with your fingers. Connie, you fool, you've been sold a pup. That seven and six has gone straight up the spout. Not that they'd actually hang him. So she's sort of th flitting her thoughts from, from two things. Oh, and Mr Puddy. Uh, don't forget Mr Puddy. He was wide awake on the job. Well, not exactly on the job, perhaps, but wide awake all the, all the same. As a matter of fact, he was taking a few minutes off in which to snatch a meal. Not a sumptuous meal, admittedly, but something that would help keep him going, a tin of baked beans, in fact, uh, and he was sitting hungrily watching them as they came to boil in a tin saucepan on the gas ring in the caretaker's little office. They wouldn't be long now. The print band had already detached itself from the tin and was swirling around in the water. There's nothing like a few Heinzes... There's, oh, sorry. There's nothing like a few Heinzes if you want a snack, he said half aloud. Talking to himself had become a habit in these long night watches. That, that's my door. Bear with me one second. Sorry, I will be back. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm just in the middle of my show. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, that's all right. Just making a cup of the pit. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologise. That was just uh, young Sharifa who um, had forgotten her key and was just taking some stuff to the tip. Anyway, there's nothing like a few Heinzes if you want a snack, he said half aloud, talking to him. Talking to himself had become a habit in these long night watches. They're, th they're quick and they're tasty, he paused. And if he dud it, he told himself, uh, and if he dud it, he told himself, if he dud it, I say he ought to pay the penalty. You can't go about murdering people. But nothing about Percy. He's a bit of a dulcimer street, isn't he? He's a number tenor. Hasn't he got a right to any views on his own position? Yes, he has. But they're shaky views, decidedly shaky. He's sitting up in the trestle thing that they call a bed and he's arguing it out with himself. They've had him up in the court twice already, once for stealing a car and once for murdering a blonde. It's enough to worry anyone. I wonder I wonder if I'll be OK, he's thinking. Mr. Mr. Barks said not to worry, and he's smart. He knows the ropes. I think he likes me. I'm his big break now. I'm headlines. He paused. It's me... It's me it's not so good for. I'm the one to take the rap. His stomach turned over inside him at the thought. I wonder if I'll be OK, he asked himself again. It was about the hundredth time that he'd asked himself that question and each time the answer seemed farther away and more dubious than before. I wonder if I'll be OK. And we are now on chapter 38, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. Mr. Squail is so creepy. <laughs> he is creepy. He is creepy. Alistair Sim played him magnificently in the film. A week passed. A gnawing, insistent, sleep-defying sort of week and the strain of it proved too much for Mrs Boone. She collapsed under it. Nor was this very surprising, 
refusing anything that Mrs Josser sent up for her, she simply shut herself in her room, fasting. In consequence, she grew weaker and weaker. And then, just when she realised that she must eat something, if she meant to keep going, then she act when she was actually on her way to the shops, in fact, she fainted. This is after all... All nothing very exceptional in the simple act of faint... Sorry, there is, after all, nothing very exceptional in the simple act of fainting. It is something that has happened to most women and they have not been noticeably any worse for it and nothing especially disastrously occurred in the act itself. Even the situation of the faint was fortunate just outside Littles, the chemist in the Woolworth Road. Two men, a postman and a van driver, strong, unemotional fellows, both of them, lifted her up with ease and carried her into the little front shop. Miss, Mr Little came forward, mixed a dose of sol volatile and waved a bottle of smelling salts under the unconscious woman's nose, while the two men, the postman and the van driver, stood about wearing the strained, slightly self-conscious expressions of rescuers. But when the smelling salts had no effect, and when Mr Littell, supporting Mrs Boone's head in the crook of his arms, found that he couldn't really force any of the sole volatile down her throat, he surrendered his charge to higher authority. Laying her down flat, he informed his two carers that he was going to phone up for an ambulance. To cover up for his failure, he uttered the single word, heart, indicating on his own body the position of the affected organ as he did so. He said the word impressively as though to indicate that he, it was no inadequacy on his part, merely professional etiquette that was involved. But because there was, uh, because there was clearly nothing else they could do, indeed they'd been doing, they hadn't been doing anything for the last five minutes, the postman and the van driver went off to their individual jobs and a policeman turned up and took over from them. But it was different for the ordinary passers-by, who had only just noticed what was happening. They were naturally fascinated by the presence of an elderly woman in black lying stretched out flat in the small lock-up shop. The crowd formed itself around the doorway, and this inevitably shut off the newcomers. In consequence, rumour began to spread along those who arrived late. The woman was mortally injured. She was dying. She was probably dead already. There was one person in particular who was anxious to see anything that was going on, and this was a small woman in very tight blue dress with a design in sequins all down the front. She'd been almost at the other end of the Woolworth Road when Mrs Boone had had her attack, but her sixth sense, or whatever it was, told her where to find the excitement and brought her along just in time. She wasn't engaged in any particular business, just cruising, as she called it, and when she got to the doorway, things looked pretty hopeless. There was a dozen spectators already, and none of them seemed to have seen enough even saying that she had called round for a prescription that was being made up for a little girl had no effect on them. They were stubborn and an obstinate lot. And small as she was, she couldn't ferret her way in because the door was too narrow. Silly lot of rubbernecks, she thought to herself contemptuously as she stood there watching them. Proper pack of nosy parkers. It probably isn't anything anyway. The sound of the ambulance bell urged her on, however. Eventually, it was something, and she wasn't going to get much of a peep at it. Then, as the big white Talbot drew up smoothly at the curb and the two attendants and a policeman jumped down, she had an idea. It was something that she had worked before in similar circumstances, and it worked again this time. When the two attendants got out their stretcher and walked importantly through the middle of the crowd, Connie followed them as closely like a plain-clothes nurse. She was inside the shop as easy as kiss your hand. Once inside, there was the surprise of her life waiting for her. At first, she stood back politely near the doorway, knowing that in 
In a crowd, policemen often have a habit of kicking out backwards like a horse. But as one of the attendants lifted the victim's head, Connie caught sight of her face. She shot forward. Just in time, she exclaimed. I couldn't get here sooner. In the result, she was accepted. And more than accepted, she went off victoriously in the ambulance, climbing up the little collapsible ladder at the back like Lady Mayoress. She always liked Mrs Boone, especially since it had happened, and she was glad that there... She was glad that she was there in case there was any little thing that she could do for her. But so long as Mrs Boone's coma lasted, there was nothing. So she made herself pleasant to the policeman who had got in with her. Dropping her voice in case Mrs Boone should come round again while she was speaking, she touched him on the shoulder. Name of Percy Boone, car bandit murderer. Convey anything to you, Inspector? she said. Because that's his old mum you've got there. She's a proper little madam, isn't she, that Connie? My goodness. They were ever so nice to Mrs Boone in the infirmary. Couldn't have been nicer, in fact. Everything was of the best. The food, the service, the medical attention. There was even a pair of headphones over the bed in case she wanted a bit of music or a sports commentary. But for the present, at any rate, all she seemed to want was just to be left alone. She still cried a lot. When visiting day came round, Mrs Josser managed to get the sister to herself for a moment. The sister was inclined to be cagey at first, but Mrs Josser persisted and finally she got it out of her. It was just as she expected, a stroke, and it was going to be a long job. All that Mrs Boone could do, the sister explained, was to lie there and take things easily and not worry. That was why it was so important that the things they talked about when they came to see her should be bright and cheerful. Keep her spirits up, the sister said firmly. It's the little things that count. Just let her feel that everything is going pleasantly here and at home. The ignorance of the sister's remarks amazed Mrs Josser. Either the sister was a very stupid woman or else Connie had somehow or other overlooked her. The explanation turned out to be quite simple. The sister was only a temporary relief while the regular was away. The regular knew all about Mrs Boone's secret and she appreciated it. In nearly 12 years nursing Mrs Boone... In nearly 12 years nursing Mrs Boone, sorry, in nearly 12 years, years, nursing Mrs Boone was the first interesting patient that she'd ever had. In point of fact, Mrs Boone didn't give Mrs Josser very much opportunity of talking. She merely lay there with her eyes closed, occasionally reaching up for a handkerchief that was under the corner of her pillow. Only once did she emerge from her lethargy after her first grateful smile to Mrs Josser for having come at all, and that was to beckon her over and whisper into her ear. Ask Fred to keep an eye on Percy, she said. He can see him any Thursday. I'm afraid he may be missing me. We'll look after him, don't you worry, Mrs Josser promised. She drew in her lips, however, as she said it. She was not at all anxious that Mr Josser should get himself drawn any deeper into Percy's affairs. What was more, it would be the first time that any member of her family had ever been inside prison, even on visitor's day. Chapter 39. Shall we proceed? But Mrs Josser couldn't be expected to keep her mind on Percy. Not entirely, that is, because Doris was already taking up a large part of it. Without asking anybody's advice or permission, having, in fact, exactly as Mrs Josser herself had behaved some 30 years previously, she had got engaged. In other words, within a fortnight of having her safely back under the back home under the fiasco of that Hampstead flat of hers, they were going to lose her again. 
Like all important things, it had seemed sudden. Less than a week ago, last Tuesday to be exact, Doris had mentioned or even announced that she was going... That Doris had announced what was going to happen and today, the day on which Mr Josser was supposed to be seeing Percy, the Jossers were to meet Bill's people. It promised to be an overcrowded sort of day, prison in the afternoon and an engagement party in the evening. Because of the engagement party, Mrs Josser was on edge. She recognised the occasion for what it was, a full tribal evening, and she steeled herself. It was going to be the first opportunity of talking over rival taboos and inquiring, not openly of course, but discreetly and by innuendo, into the strengths of the young man and the dowry of the maiden. The, tro the trocadero at Seven Sharp had been chosen for the ritual ceremony. Mr Josser wasn't particularly looking forward to it either, he knew Bill, and that surprised it, and that seemed to be enough for him. But Mrs Josser, who was looking forward to it even less, insisted. It was just one of those things that was required. Even if one of those Jossers even if one of the Jossers didn't know one of sorry, even if one of the Jossers didn't know the first steps in the marriage dance, there was another tribe, her tribe, the Knuckles, that did. What was, wor what was worrying her was the question of clothes. She didn't know what to wear. And she was afraid that Mrs Davenport would know only too well and wear it. In the result, her plans alternated between something black and no hat and her blue costume with her felt hat turned up in front. She wished now that she had been in the habit of dropping into the Trocadero more often so that she could have seen what other people habitually wore at seven sharp. The dilemma had been facing her for nearly 48 hours, but it was only as the day itself came round that she grew really worried. On the very morning when she should be had been looking forward to a pleasant evening in town with some nice new friends and a bottle of wine on the table and a foreign-looking waiter asking her if she'd take black coffee with cream. She woke up feeling very nervy and depressed and by breakfast the anxiety had increased to a fever. Only last night she had been certain that, of course, her blue costume was all right she had even pressed it carefully with a damp cloth in readiness. But in the harsh early hours, in the light, she saw things differently. She owed it to Doris, she told herself, to wear something different. A fine tribal impression it would make if Mrs Davenport and her brave turned up all covered in feathers and wampum, and she and Mrs Josser were the only ones in their second best blanket. The real trouble, however, was that she hadn't got a best dress. What with Mr Josser's illness and one thing and another, it had been, good gracious, it was nearly five years since she'd bought herself a dress. There had been blouses, of course, and an odd skirt or two, but nothing, absolutely nothing, which she would have cared to be caught sight of in one of the Trocadero mirrors. During breakfast... She finally argued herself into a fierce state of justification. She had left it too long. Far too long, she told herself. It was positively ridiculous having nothing newer than 1935. She was so much preoccupied with the matter that Mr Josser noticed it and looked across at her. Everything all right, mother? he asked. The question annoyed Mrs Josser. She was on the verge of deciding and this wasn't the moment that she wanted to be interrupted. Moreover, turning to him suddenly in this way, she couldn't help noticing that quite a lot was wrong with him too. You've got to go and get yourself a haircut. That's what you've got to do, she told him. Mr Josser got up and examined himself in the mirror. I've, I've known it longer, he said. Well... You should know it shorter, Mrs Josser told him tartly. You're not coming out with me looking like that. 
She'd got up and began clearing away as she said it. Mr Josser would like to have sat there a bit longer, but with, with the breakfast things on the table and possibly another cup of tea, he, he felt like it, but he recognised that this was evidently not one of those mornings. Rather reluctantly, he put his cup onto the tray that Mrs Josser was loading and saw it whisked away before his very eyes. A note of extreme urgency was now discernible in Mrs Josser's actions. No sooner had she cleared away than she came back with an apron tied around her and went about putting the room to right. Mr Josser eyed her silently for a few moments and then went through into the bedroom because he was so obviously in the way in the other room. But once Mrs Josser finished what she was doing, she shot into the bedroom after him. Displaced from there, Mr Josser went into the kitchen and started to do a, a little uh, desultory washing up. Within five minutes, Mrs Josser was beside him, snatching the things out of his hands and drying them. Then, while the last cap, cup, while the last cup was still swinging to rest on its hook on the dresser, she announced that she was going out. She didn't say where or for how long, merely that if she wasn't back by lunchtime, Mr Josser was to get himself a meal and not wait for her. She added that he was to have a haircut and that, above all things, that he was not to get back late from seeing Percy. They were starting for the Trocadero. They were starting for the Trocadero at six sharp. She told him, and she wasn't going to be rushed for anybody. And indeed not. And that's where we're going to leave it. She is off to buy a dress. Clearly, she hasn't had a dress, a nice new dress, since 1935, and he hasn't had a haircut for a while. And they're going to go to an engagement party and. He, Mr Joss is going to go and visit Percy in prison. And my goodness, it's all going on. But there we are. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Sorry about my rushing to answer the door. Hope you enjoyed the story. Back again tomorrow on Wednesday. Um, look after yourselves. Thanks very much for listening. And um, thank you for uh, Zagreb. Yeah, Zagreb. It's, a t it's yes, in town. Yes, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not very good at... Uh, I always forget. I don't know why. Rubbish at these names and things. But there you go. Can't be good at everything. Anyway, look after yourself. No Vogue show tonight. Um, and I will catch up with you tomorrow. Nice little video for you tomorrow. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. I hope you like it. In the meantime, thank you for watching. And I will bid you adieu. Goodbye. Take care. Have fun. I'm looking to turn this off. I've forgotten how to do it. Oh, it's down here. That's why. Couldn't see the button I was looking for. Toodlepip! <laughs>